This is Sunday Focus, a weekly public affairs program that looks at the topics affecting our society and the people who are making a change in the community each and every day. The people who have vision for the next generation. Sunday Focus presents new challenges for us, keeping you informed with topics of local and regional interest. Now the host of Sunday Focus, Christine Manica. Good morning. Coming up on this edition of Sunday Focus, I will talk to the development manager of the American Cancer Society in Sioux Falls, Rachel Gross, and the co-owner and winemaker for the Wild Prairie Winery, Victoria Wild. Hey. How are you? I'm great today. Thanks for having me. Of course, you know, it's never too early to have wine. Maybe it is right now. I don't know. It's five o'clock somewhere in the world. But let's start at the beginning with Wild Prairie Winery. How did this company get started for you? Well, we it wasn't a plan. It was basically <laughs> we uh, grew up in California. My husband's a South Dakotan, but he grew up in California. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a little tiny property and thought I'd have my own grapes and my own um, wine making do that. Um, that I did go to when I was in college. I finishing up. I took grape growing and uh, wine making. So that's how I learned uh, was in college. And uh, so anyway, we moved to South Dakota because we didn't want to raise our kids in California. Mm-hmm. So we got here and about two years into living here, I found out you could grow grapes here. And so I started planting grapes and people started telling me about these weird wines like rhubarb strawberry, rhubarb raspberry, dandelion. I thought they were crazy. But you know what? I on, I'm on an adventure, so yeah. I started making all kinds of wine. Uh, the legal amount of wine you can make in a year per premise is 100 gallons in the There's United States. There's a legal States. limit for even that? Yes. What? You have to pay taxes after you have 100 gallons. Huh. So I got close to that, and it was a very small area here when we first moved here 34 years ago. And so um, we thought, well, maybe we should get licensed. Mm. So we started out in the, our house. Um, we, our great room is where we did our tastings. We made all the wine in the basement of our house. And we, have a, we live in a house that was built in 1911. Uh, so anyway, we started growing. We never expected that, but we kept growing and growing. We had to find another building. And our, we have a dairy barn on our property. So we cleaned that up and we moved into that. And we've been in there for quite a while now. And so that's kind of how we got started. I love how you say planting your roots, growing your roots like a grapevine kind yeah, of. there you go. So going back to the start of those roots, you said that your husband lived in California. Did he get sort of an inspiration just for meeting you and then coming up with this business together? It's funny, the the um, other day we were just discussing how did we get started in the wine stuff, you know, as far as the love for it. Mm-hmm. Well, when we lived in California, we would go to a winery. And we do a tasting, and then we buy a bottle of wine. We always carried, like, um, crackers and cheese and hard salami and stuff, and we put it in a backpack, go hiking or go jeeping or whatever, and enjoy it. And so that's where our love came from. Okay. And if anybody is interested in being a winemaker, where did you go to college? Just out of curiosity, uh, <laughs> how, how does that, how is that even a major nowadays? Well, it is a major in a lot of things. Mm. I actually went to another college that they sent the um, professors from UC Davis to teach us. Oh, okay. So it was awesome. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, of course, have a lot of experience being out in California. So we were talking about, before we started this interview, different products that you have. So let's talk about the wine first. What kind of wine do you make? Well, first of all, we use 100% South Dakota grown products. We don't bring anything over the border, which sometimes gives us a little trouble because we can't get some fruit. But yeah. most of the time we're good. And we grow three acres of our own grapes. Uh, and then there's a couple other vineyards in South Dakota we buy from. And also like Sanderson's Gardens, we get our strawberries, raspberries, and rhubarb from them. So we do make several grape wines. We make uh, white um uh, let's see, a dry, a medium, and a little bit sweeter white. We do a lot of fruit wines that are um, rhubarb raspberry, rhubarb strawberry, apple raspberry. We also do the red wines. We have uh, three dread red wines on our tasting table and two sweeter red wines. Um, we also do rosé. And let's see, what else do we have there? We are doing a raspberry mead. That'll be coming out really soon. And Ooh. that's very tasty. goes great with dark chocolate. 
Okay, now yeah. you're really speaking my language. <laughs> Keep going, Victoria. I'm still listening. <laughs> so um, we also do dandelion wine every so often, and that's a un- it's very unique and very labor intensive. But we do do a small batch of that every once in a while. And then also in our tasting room, if you come out um, or when you come out, <laughs> um, we have also my art. I'm an artist, a mm-hmm. watercolorist, and so you can have wine and art all in one place. Wow. So with that love for wine and art are there opportunities maybe say you want to host a painting class and do like a wine and paint type thing we do do those once in a while yes Mm -hmm. we have one coming up i believe in the end of july yep okay so roughly give me a rough estimate here how many bottles would you say that you cork each year (laughs) i know Uh, 500 cases worth of corks really at least i think we're a little higher than that now but yep what do you think is the favorite wine that you have uh it's called sweet red Sweet. and so it's kind of between a semi-sweet and a sweet it's made with a frontenac grape it goes wonderful with a grilled steak dark chocolate bold cheeses Mm. and it's good because and you can have it chilled or warm it's one of those oh i love that so in the heat chilled oh perfect absolutely especially with the heat that we're going to be having throughout the summer really now you have a lot of great events coming out here so that means in my mind plenty of opportunities for people to come out to taste your wine and even check out the the property as well so why don't you tell us a little bit about the events you have going on yeah come on out and relax with us bring your lawn chair bring your family you know dog however you want to be and just come out and do a wine tasting so we have um, music live music from 2 to 5 every Sunday until Labor Day weekend. That's our last one. And then um, we have a f- evenings in the vineyard. Um, I believe they're the fourth Friday night of the month mm-hmm. um, through ju- uh, June, July, and August. And then, of course, we have our finale, um, our um, harvest festival, where we really celebrate the harvest. And usually we're done with our harvest, but not always. <laughs> <laughs> All depends on the season, right? Yes. Yeah. So when you look back, you said 34 years you've lived here in mm-hmm. South Dakota now. When you look back at where you started to where your business is now, what is something that you can look back on and say, hey, we did this. We grew this business, literally. Well, first of all, we weren't looking at growing it. We were just looking at enjoying and, and whatever. And we st- I still enjoy making wine. Um, but we just started growing and growing. Like we grew out of our basement of our house. Um, we're, if you look down in our winery, it is packed with tanks of wine that are in pro- different processes. Awesome. If you are just listening, Victoria Wild, she is the owner, one of the owners, and a winemaker for Wild Prairie Winery. Now, Victoria, for anyone who hasn't been out to the farm yet, where can people find you? What's the address? Um, We're at 48052. 259th Street, and it's a Brandon address, but we're north and west of Corson. Okay. So if that helps, um, you want to either come up Arrows Highway or uh, what is it called now? The Veterans um, Parkway. You can come up that way to our street or you can come up Highway 11. Now, do you sell these wines in stores yet? Yes. Oh, you do? Where do yes. you sell them at? Uh, World Market carries them, uh, Fogies Liquor. Uh, we picked up a few other new ones, too, and then Willikers. And then we're out in a little bit in Mitchell, Demick okay. area, and then a little bit on the other side of the state. Awesome. So. You know, at all the Results Town Square Media websites, we have a lot of information about the Wild Prairie Winery, as well as the events that you guys have going on. And just really quick, Victoria, the website that people can follow you on, too. It's wild, W-I-L-D-E, Prairie Winery. Com. All right. Awesome. Victoria, thanks for giving us a little bit of your time this morning. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. We'll be right back, maybe with a glass of wine even. Uh-huh. <laughs> if you're driving on the interstate, a state highway, a county highway, through town, or on a gravel road, this message is for you. Buckle up. Don't skip the click. Crashes don't discriminate. They happen everywhere. Hi, I'm Trooper Peterson with the South Dakota Highway Patrol reminding you that wearing your seatbelt is one of the best ways to protect yourself while driving. Buckle up, don't skip the click. This message brought to you by the South Dakota Highway Patrol and Results Town Square Media. 
There's always a defining moment when you realize you have no control over what your teen says, over what your teen does, over who your teen hurts. When you reach that defining moment and you're thinking there's nothing more you can do, do what other parents have done. Call Hope Harbor or go to HopeHarborMN.org. Hope Harbor helps struggling girls and boys ages 12 to 17. When you think there's nothing more you can do, there is hope. Hope Harbor. Welcome back to another edition of Sunday Focus. I'm being joined in the studio right now by Rachel Gross. She is the development manager in Sioux Falls for the American Cancer Society. This is a great organization here in the Sioux Empire, and they have a lot of great events coming up too. But first, let's say hello to Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Christine. How are you? You know, I'm doing great. Thanks for taking time this morning to be part of the show. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of events coming up for you guys, including Relay for Life here in Sioux Falls. But before we get into any of that, Let's talk about the American Cancer Society itself. For anyone who isn't familiar, why don't you tell us about it? I would love to tell you a little bit more about the American Cancer Society. Yeah. Our mission is to save lives, celebrate lives, and lead to the fight for a world without cancer. So that sounds really broad, but we really work hard at eliminating cancer in any way possible. We've been around since 1918, so we're not a new organization, but we have new, new challenges mm-hmm. every day and new goals that we work toward. Uh, One of the big things that we're really proud of is that since 1991, the cancer death rate in the United States has dropped by 32% due to cancer research, um, and that has developed from new treatments and new medications, Um, and that's translated into 3.5 million lives saved since 1991. So our new goal is by 2035, actually, is to have a cancer death rate drop by 40%. Mm. Um, So overall, we just, our goal is really just to improve the lives of cancer patients and their families. And our efforts at local events, they're all directed towards supporting local patients and aiding ACS and our advocacy group, ACS Can, in reaching those goals. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting how you brought up this is the United States. This is the whole country's goal, not just South Dakota. So this organization really brought out beyond the Sioux Empire. So with that in mind, how does this organization play a role here in the Sioux Falls community? Yeah, we definitely play a role by supporting those local cancer patients and their families here. Our local events, which include our Relay for Life that's coming up here in July, as well as our Magic of Hope Gala, are both aimed at raising money for as many cancer patients as possible. Um, We currently fund lodging and transportation grants throughout the state, including at both cancer centers located here in Sioux Falls at Avera and Sanford. Um, We're really proud of the partnership that we have with both health systems and are really proud to say that the American Cancer Society can help connect patients to amazing oncologists and amazing support at those local health systems Um, and just really committed to providing financial support to any patients who need it as we know that cancer is a fight across many different levels, including a financial level. Now, how many people would you say within the Sioux Empire are diagnosed each year? Just a rough estimates, statewide numbers here. Yeah, statewide, it's estimated that over 5,300 new cancer cases will be developed each year with an over 1,700 cancer deaths each year. Um, Specifically in our Sioux Empire area, the most prevalent cancer cases, excuse me, are prostate and breast cancer. So Mm -hmm. it's definitely a fight that touches a lot of people within our community. Absolutely. Now, do you have the number of survivors by any chance? Not at the top of my head. We don't have like a full listing of survivor numbers, but do have over that 50, almost 5,400 patients every year that are diagnosed with new cases. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, what programs and services do you offer the American from the American Cancer Society? Now, you hinted at them a couple of times already, but go into a little bit more depth about it if you can. Yes, there are a lot of things that we have in terms of programs and services offered offered by the American Cancer Society. Um, Just to name a few, we offer information and referral services for anyone with questions after they receive a diagnosis. We have different support group access for those who need not only, you know, medical information, but are wanting emotional support. And we do provide, like I said, those lodging and transportation services, um, plus more. Um, And it really depends on where you're at and where you're located, what's available to you. And a lot of things have moved online as well with the pandemic. So we really encourage all patients, caregivers, and family members to visit www.cancer.org for all information on available services near you. Absolutely. Now, you hinted at it already how 
everything has moved online because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, from an organization standpoint that helps, you know, vulnerable people, how has this affected the American Cancer Society as a whole, COVID? Yes, I would say it's had a huge impact on the American Cancer Mm -hmm. Society, especially in terms of people being out to, you know, get cancer screenings in a timely method, you know, and receive, talk to their doctor. Of course, when you're, when there's a pandemic going on, not as many people are able to just run over to the hospital. Um, So our efforts have really been focused on getting people back to regular screenings and and back to in-person events as much as safe. Um, But it's really changed the way that we operate and having kind of a digital first mentality on things and having more online options available for not only fundraising, but for online support for patients who need it. Yeah, you were telling me, Rachel, about how you got involved with the American Cancer Society. You kind of had an interesting journey. So you were at O'Gorman High School. Yep, at their foundation. Yep, yep, yep. yep. And then you moved on to the American Cancer Society as the development manager. And it's been interesting from what I've been hearing. You're you're working from home and you're having somewhat of interaction with your coworkers and patients and whatnot. So uh, the main question here is how did you really get involved with the American Cancer Society? Yeah, cancer, this is a really new role to me. I guess I should start by saying that, that I've just been in this role since January of 2022. Um, but cancer is something that is not new to me or new to my family. Um, You know, as young as, oh, wow, probably eight years old or something, I think, is when my grandpa was first diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, And I've had several other cancer diagnoses in my family, as well as several cancer deaths. Um, So cancer and the fight against cancer has always been something that I've been really passionate about and supporting in my personal life. And then when I saw this position open up, it was something that I knew I really wanted to support because Unfortunately, I truly believe that cancer is something that will touch all of us in some capacity throughout our lifetime, whether that be as a patient or as a caregiver. And I'm just very proud and really happy to be working with ACS in the fight for the cure. Yeah, I'm sure you mentioned that your when your grandfather was diagnosed, you were fairly young. And probably at that age, you're thinking, gosh, what can I do to, to help him out? So would you say that being a part of the American Cancer Society is your way to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to help you out or I'm here for you now? Yes. And it definitely, I think, is a way to kind of translate of knowing what it looks like when someone has to go through cancer and yeah. what at all stages what that can mean for a patient. But to be able to help people that are going through that now and to be able to provide the support monetarily, but also to be able to provide that community support for patients um, and their families, you know, because it's not a fight that anyone fights alone. So there's a lot of different people to help and support through the cancer fight. Yeah, you know, you took the words right out of my mouth, Rachel. No one does fight this disease alone. Not only are patients battling cancer, but I think it's also safe to say that the loved ones, caregivers are in the fight with them. So besides the options for patients, are there any programs or some sort of classes for caregivers and loved ones? Yes, we always recommend that cancer caregivers who are looking for extra support contact our National Cancer Information Center, or our NCIC. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week at 1-800-227-2345. And they provide trained, caring staff that can deliver information and support when and where people need it. So anytime you have a question, even if you think it's small or maybe silly or you just want someone to talk to about the cancer journey and how to support your loved one going through cancer treatment. Um, There's someone there um, to talk that with you, whether that be, you know, financial concerns, talking about hair loss or mastectomy products, lodging transportation, all those good things. Um, We even have on-call nurses that are available to talk to anyone who needs them. Um, Our NCIC actually responds to more than 1.4 million inquiries annually. So definitely if you have any questions, they're more than happy to help. Absolutely. If you were just listening, I'm being joined by Rachel Gross. She is in the studio, the development manager for the American Cancer Society here in Sioux Falls, talking about the organization and the events that you guys have coming up, including this one. There are a variety of events that can benefit the American Cancer Society. And this one happening on Friday, July 22nd at Sertoma Park. It's the big Relay for Life. Now, Rachel, tell us about Relay for Life and how this event got started. I love that question. This is one of my favorite stories that I'm <laughs> learning through my journey with ACS. I yeah. mean, um, it's really just a story about how one person can really make a difference. 
It was back in May of 1985 that Dr. Gordy Klatt, he walked and ran for 24 hours straight around a track in Tacoma, Washington, um, to raise money in support of the American Cancer Society um, for the nation's biggest health concern, which is cancer. So he spent over 24 hours just circling the track at a university while his family, friends, and patients watched and supported him. And he ran more than 83.6 miles and raised over $27,000 through pledges to help save more lives. And as he circled that track, he later commented that he thought of how he could get others to take part. And it not just be a one-time thing that he does, but how he could really have that movement spread throughout the country. Um, so he envisioned having teams participate just in a 24-hour mm -hmm. fundraising event, not just him, but inviting other community members to join him. And the next year, 19 teams were formed at the first official Relay for Life event, um, and they, they raised over $33,000. Since then, he had previously battled stomach cancer, but Gordy passed away from heart failure on August 3rd, 2014, at the age of 71. But his legacy definitely lives on. He shaped this idea of having one man walking and running around a track and help turn it into a global fundraising phenomenon. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty amazing story, especially when when one man can make a difference like that. Back when when I was in college a little over a while ago now, um, we had nights where we dedicated to Relay for Life and we did walk around the campus for for 24 hours at least. I don't know. Did, did you experience something like that in college? Not in my college, we didn't have it. My sister had one where she talked about those sit-ins, yeah. you know, where you'd go in all night or go super late, almost kind of like those church church lock-in nights of just going all, all through the night and having different ways to have fun and support um, while raising money for a great cause. Yeah, this is going to be a great event here in the Sioux Empire. It is on Friday, July 22nd at Sertoma Park. It starts at 6, and you know, myself, my radio partner, Andy God, we are proud to be representing the results town square media crew and being the MCs for this event we already know what we're going to expect kind of but for anyone who wants to participate or plans to participate what can they expect during the night at, for relay for life yes this is will be a really fun evening yeah. just to support cancer patients and honor survivors who've been fighting the disease and also to remember those and take time to really honor those who we've lost um, this is a chance for survivors to connect with each other and catch up through the different survivor activities and really reconnect with people who they maybe haven't seen in the past couple years as we've been remote since COVID. Um, like you said, you and Andy will be at the event mm -hmm. to be our MCs. And we also have Jessica Black, who is a realtor from Keller Williams, who's a fierce caregiver support advocate. She's going to be our speaker um, and we'll be talking about caregiver support. And we're also really excited. Uh, Miss South Dakota Hunter Whidbey will be in attendance to sing our national anthem. Oh, nice. Um, so we have a lot of fun things going on. And one of the big things, too, that I wanted to talk about is the opportunity to purchase Luminaria bags, mm -hmm. um, which is a huge part of the event, that we line the track with these bags that you can purchase and decorate in honor of a survivor or in memory of someone that you've lost due to cancer. And then at dusk, we light all those bags up and take a silent walk in honor of those people who have been fighting cancer, who have lost that battle. And it's something that even if you can't attend the event, it's something you can order right online off of our website, and we can even decorate them for you just to have representation of your loved ones. Um, and it's something we're really, really excited about. So we encourage anyone who's listening to, to check out our Luminaria options and honor your loved ones and have them be present and remembered here at our Relay for Life. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you talk about a walk at the end of the night, how long is this walk? Is it around... Sertoma Park? Is it going to be on the bike trail? Yeah, we have it around the little um, rotunda that's there at Sertoma Park. So it's nice and ADA accessible for anyone who maybe has mobility issues or is in potentially a wheelchair. We'll be along that sidewalk. It's about a one-tenth of a mile track. So it's a little shorter than in years past. So we'll be maybe getting dizzy, but it'll be a fun time and a nice accessible way for us to all be together in a really intimate way for the first time since 2019. Absolutely. Now that has to be a good feeling in itself to have an event come back like this and this being your first one too. Yes, I am so excited that we're going to be able to do it in person. Um, there's really unique challenges that come up with doing virtual events and especially something like this that's really about the survivors and providing community support. Um, the important part is to be able to get together and really celebrate together and really honor those lives that we've lost and that's 
something that's hard to get online or through a screen. So I, I couldn't be happier that we're able to do this in person. Oh, absolutely. Now, the event starts at 6 once again, Friday, July 22nd at Sertoma Park. When will the walking start? When will the walking stop? Just to get people all ready and pumped up and energized. Yes. Too. <laughs> Registration starts at 6 o'clock, or we'll kind of get kicked off at 6 o'clock. Mm-hmm. Uh, people can show up early, um, but that's when we'll officially be starting at 6 o'clock. Um, and starting that walk, um, you can take breaks in between. You don't have to walk the, the whole time straight through. Um, we'll have different activities and different things for you to do. The silent auction will be available. You um, could stop at our information booth and learn more. As well as teams are also always invited to have fun things at their booths. So it's always a fun time, too, to walk through the campsites and see what different teams are doing for entertainment for the evening. Uh, the walk, we do conclude with our luminaria ceremony that will go at dusk. Um, so it's roughly that whole time we'll have people walking but have breaks in between whenever you need to stop and do something fun or if your kids need to run over and play on the playground, all that <laughs> stuff. Nothing continuous that's required, but we'll have people walking throughout the event. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you also said this night is about honoring the survivors and their caregivers. Now, are there going to be survi- survivors that are going to share their stories? Yes, the survivors, that is one of the most important parts about this event is really supporting our survivors Mm -hmm. and giving them a chance to connect. Um, We're really inviting our survivors to sign up and they can attend our survivor meal, which is sponsored by the Sioux Falls JCs. And this is the time when survivors get to enjoy a meal and just catch up with one another and share their individual stories and their, their progress over the last couple years and any updated prognosises. And survivors are welcomed as well to participate in our special survivor lap during the event. Right at the beginning, we'll kick that off with a survivor lap. Um, And it's a really fun time for them to really show off and be proud of their battle that they're courageously fighting. Now, Rachel, I know know that you've only started a a short while ago, but are there any survivor or caregiver stories that stick out in your mind just from meeting uh, some people here and there? Yes, there are countless survivor stories we have in the Sioux Falls area that my volunteers have been able to share with me. Um, We're really lucky to have the community that we have that there's, you know, almost too many to count awesome stories of people coming to Relay. But a couple that I that really stand out to me is one volunteer. She fondly remembers a survivor who fought cancer 17 times. Oh, my gosh. But was still, she said, so upbeat and inspiring at every Relay and just was a really positive light throughout it all, and despite having fought cancer so many times. Um, another survivor mentioned that they knew a survivor who's named Mark, who was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Um, and he well, didn't have a great outlook when he was diagnosed, so he actually went out and proactively purchased a cemetery plot and got his headstone, uh, but he did survive. So he's been coming to Relay for the past 13 years or more, and is always a fun one to share stories of never losing, never losing hope and never giving up, even when things could look dark. Absolutely. Now, you already kind of went through the schedule for the evening. Six o'clock is when the event starts. Check in a little bit before there, then and after then at Sertoma Park. You're going to do the luminary walk sometime around dusk and just gather people around. Now, if people still want to go sign up for the event and just find out more information about the American Cancer Society, where can they go? So they can go on our website to not only learn more, but also to sign up your personal or business team. It's at www.relayforlife.org slash Sioux Falls. You can also reach out to me directly. I can answer any questions for you before you sign up. Um, And you can reach me. My email is rachel.gross at cancer.org. And I'm always more than happy to help as well. Oh, yeah, that's that's awesome to hear. This is going to be a great event. This is going to be your first one for the American Cancer Society. So, Rachel, what are you looking forward to? I think I'm really looking forward to just the ability to see everyone again and to really connect with it being my first year and with, you know, working remotely. Um, you know, I've been able to connect with some of my volunteers, but I'm really excited to see the other audience members who I've been communicating with, you know, the last several months via phone and email. And I'm just excited to have that that face-to-face time and just really get to know each other and get to 
experience what really, really should be, which is that, you know, community building support event. Yeah, we are we are very proud to be part of this event and we're looking forward to to helping you guys out and spreading the word about it too. So once again, it's Rachel Gross. She is the development manager in Sioux Falls for the American Cancer Society. Relay for Life is Friday, July 22nd at Sertoma Park. You can find out more information for Relay for Life at relayforlife.org slash Sioux Falls. Rachel, thanks for giving us a little bit of time today. Yeah, thank you so much and thank you both for you know, being our MCs, we're so excited to have you out there. It'll be a, a fun night. If you listen to them, you know how much fun they are. We're really excited about it. We'll, we'll, we'll keep a G for, for the audience that night. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Sunday Focus is a public affairs program of Results Radio Town Square Media Sioux Falls.